for this study here, we were basically interested how different uh, handling or pre-analytical workflows uh, for plasma and serum samples affect your isolated vesicles and the RNA you get from the vesicles. So what we're using, the method we're using to get to the vesicles and the RNA is uh, spin column based. So first, before we start the actual protocol, we filter our plasma and serum to get rid of remaining cells and cell fragments, debris and stuff, because that's what you're not interested in usually. And then we mix with a binding buffer applied to the column wash. And then if we're after the RNA, we elute with a lysis buffer. So basically we can get a lysate and apply that to our RNA column and get the RNA out of that. And alternatively, when we want to get intact vesicles, we use an aqueous buffer for elution, and that gives us directly the vesicles then. Um, and this is what the vesicles basically look like when you do scanning electron micrographs. Um, so you can see it's uh, pretty much the, uh, or it's the expected size range. This is about 200 nanometers, and so some are smaller or a bit larger than that, so we get pretty all kinds of vesicles, not just exosomes, also larger vesicles. Um, so the first thing we basically checked is when we use different kinds of blood collection tubes with different uh, anticoagulants or uh, serum tubes with clot activators, how that affects our RNA yields. And so the first thing is it works with all of these. We always get nice RNA signals. The one thing that we do not recommend is heparin, because heparin is basically killing all enzymatic reactions, more or less. And it's very difficult to get rid of. So if you can avoid that, it's much better. And then you can also see, we have a, an external spike in control here. This is the gray diamonds. And you can see this is pretty much the same. So we get the same extraction and PCR efficiency from all of these. And then the individual RNA transcripts, you can see there is a bit more variation in those, depending what transcript you look at. So what it basically means, the method works with all of these, but if you're doing within a certain study, if you compare samples directly to each other, I would stick with just one type of tube to be sure it's all compar comparable. So um, what we were also interesting, the, uh, how does the time between the blood collection and the actual generation of the plasma and when you start the protocol, how does that affect your result? And this is really interesting. So what we did here, we have uh, we left the blood for either processed it directly into plasma or left it at room temperature for one or three days, basically over the weekend. Um, and then we checked at um, different microRNAs and messenger RNAs. And what we previously showed, what is known in the literature, is that some microRNA is in vesicles, and then some of it is outside, or a large portion of it is outside. Basically, a lot of it seems to be associated with AGO2 complexes. And um, what we have previously shown is that with our spin column, we only get the stuff that is in vesicles. So we can distinguish vesicular and non-vesicular very nicely. Um, and you can kind of see that in the data here as well. And we were interested how these two populations are affected by the storage of the blood. What you can see here is the blue bar is the bound vesicular fraction. And so you can see the delta CT being positive means increase of RNA. And so you can see basically all of these go up during the storage about uh, twofold after one day and up to eightfold after three days. So this is a really huge increase, and it's all coming from blood cells. So it's basically your unwanted background. And this tells you, well, it's better to use the blood fresh. And uh, if you look at the flow through, this is the non-vesicular RNA. We also see a slight increase, maybe yeah, up to twofold after one day. And then after three days, it starts to go down a lot. And what we think is what happens, the cells after collection, some blood cells die, apoptose, or release the RNA, and then that is degraded. And the microRNA is degraded a bit slowly because it's protected by AGO2 mostly, or by other um, longer RNAs, maybe by other proteins. 
And so that is also for all of them the same. And as a result of that, you can see that the representation between vesicular and non-vesicular RNA changes over time. You can see this in the second figure here, second diagram. You can see uh, MIR-16. Up means it's mainly outside vesicles. So MIR-16 is strongly outside vesicles, just a small portion is inside. It stays about the same after one day. We get this increase here. And then the, the non-vesicular portion is degraded, and you can see that after three days, it's, the majority is actually outside vesicles. The same here are three microRNAs that are outside vesicles initially, 92A and MIR-451, which is a marker of erythrocytes. And then we have LED7A, MIR-126, and MIR-150 that are preferentially inside vesicles, and they all, this preference also increases. And then the large RNAs, GAP-DH and 18S, they are exclusively pretty much inside vesicles and stay that way. So this is also telling you, I guess, how important it is to not let your samples stand around before you actually process them. And then I said before that we strongly recommend to filter the samples to remove residual blood cells and cell fragments, you can also use uh, centrifugation at that step. And so for the, this um, experiment here, we compared different conditions. People use, for example, 3,000 G for 15 minutes or 16,000 G for 10 minutes or anything in between that, basically. And we were curious to see how that affects our isolated vesicles and the RNA we get. And then we recommend usually to do a 0.8 micron filtration. And we also checked smaller filter sizes, like 200 nanometers and 100 nanometers, where you would expect that some of the larger vesicles are removed. And um, for these, we actually have to do centrifugation first, because otherwise it would clog the filter. So and if you look at the RNA, you can see the red is if you don't remove the cells. And you can see that we have a lot lower CT values. So this is like, I don't know, four or even more than four uh, cycles difference. And um, that indicates that here, over 90% of your RNA is really from cell debris, stuff that is larger than 800 nanometers. So this is the rationale why you want to get rid of that. And then you can see centrifugation and the 0.8 micron filter alone, these are about on par for all of these. Yeah? So we, this is uh, roughly the same, I guess it gets rid of all the cells. And then 16,000 G, we lose some of the RNA because we remove maybe already some of the larger vesicles. And then with the filters, it's a similar picture, the RNA gets less. What is interesting here, the effect is stronger for the large RNAs if you look at GAP-DH and 18S, they decrease by two or three cycles with each pore size increase, uh, decrease, whereas the microRNAs, they decrease a bit less. So we think that seems to indicate that maybe larger RNAs are preferentially in larger vesicles and maybe micro vesicles, whereas microRNAs are preferentially in the smaller vesicles. And we can see uh, also um, to see an effect on the vesicles themselves. Um, we used uh, the nanosite, nanoparticle tracking analysis, which uh, analyzes vesicle size based on Brownian motion. And um, what you can see here, if you look at the particle size, here's the mean particle size. You can see it's between uh, 140 and 165 nanometers. So this is roughly similar, and it's also what is expected from a mixed population of exosomes and microvesicles. And you can see that the different treatments basically do not affect that size a lot, except you have to use the 100 nanometer filter to see any noticeable effect. And here you see it's still 123 mean. It goes up to still like 200, 250. And so that means the pore size is, needs to be uh, regarded with some caution, right? And also, when we look at the um, particle concentration, it's roughly the same, and the only one which is really lower is here, the 0.1 micron filter. 
um, which is not quite the same. So for the RNA, we see a much stronger effect than for the particle concentration, which could indicate that just a subset of the vesicles actually contain significant RNA. So in conclusion, the three main take-home messages basically are uh, not to switch your blood collection device within a study or as long as you compare the samples to each other. Make sure that your plasma is generated or serum is generated um, fresh, does not allow to stand around a bit. And then uh, make sure you remove your cells and consider which method is most appropriate for your purposes. Like I said, we recommend the 0.8 micron filter.